six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at two thirteen. Clear the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of Good morning, everybody. Conley here, KVLF. It is time for the Science Nights in the Morning. We have uh, two nights assembled today. Honor Von Bonacharge is going to be back, though, soon. And uh, right here in the studio, we have uh, Dr. Thomas Schiller. And all the way from Australia, we have Dr. Sean Graham on the line. What's up, y'all? What's up? What's up? Well, well, what is up is uh, us. We're bipeds, uh, I hear. Bipeds. That's right. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking time. about today. Most of the time, yeah, unless we're really, really needing a, a tax break or something, <laughs> then we're not, then we're not <laughs> bipeds for very long. But uh, yeah, no. So we're going to be talking about standing up on our own, walking on our own two feet, that's and right. uh, how we came to that, uh, how running kind of equates into all this, and the reason why humans are at the top of the food chain. I would say, right. Well, I, th- I think uh, COVID nineteen is at the top of the food chain at the moment. <laughs> well, yeah, the micro, yeah, at the micro level, I guess technically. So we can. Follow it's 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 not too soon, right? We can we can. It's do not COVID, too soon. Uh, we can do COVID. COVID, COVID jokes. jokes are acceptable. Now. We're already canceled, so it's okay. That's. I'm, I'm sure we've been canceled <laughs> ten or twenty times. Those, those five people who listen to us are just <laughs> yeah. infuriated. Yeah. Hi, Mom. Okay. Anyway, uh, so let's go ahead and get right on into it. Now, our local uh, biologist here, Dr. Sean Graham, uh, is a runner. You're a runner, right? That's right. Yeah, I ran five miles this morning. Uh, I was running four miles a day uh, here in the mornings, and then uh, I had Australian magpies attacking me on my route. And so I switched my route to avoid those little pecker woods. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm running five miles a day to avoid getting attacked by a bird. That sounds very Australian. <laughs> it it's, does. It's, it's as Australian as it gets. I, I've been telling these Australians that I've only been attacked by – only two animals have come out of their way to attack me. And one was killer bees. Oh, and wow. And the other was a magpie. Um, wow. we're running past where it's defending its nest and you get, you get swooped down. They start snapping at you and start nibbling at your ear. It hurts like hell. I'm surprised anyway, they yeah, even let you go out to run. Day. Yeah. Mocking, yeah. mocking birds do the same thing here in the States. Hmm. Yeah. It's nothing like, nothing like what these things do. It's like, I mean, these people, the, they're considered one of the most dangerous birds in the world. They, they put people's eyes out. Uh, there's a there was a fatality associated with Australian magpies this year because one was chasing a woman who had her baby in her arms and she fell. Oh, no. Yeah. So these are Golly. Da- I mean, they're and, and yet they're beloved animals in Australia. People still like, can you imagine that if every spring there was some big crow sized bird that w- put people's eyes out and yet, you know, there would be a, just a people would massacre these birds. They'd already be extinct in the U S well, I but guess in con- Australia they're revered considering the other, uh, animals that live in Australia. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah being, being a herper, have you come across any brown snakes? Oh yeah. The brown snakes are starting to come out there. In fact, there was a brown snake, uh, at the park where I take my kids hiding under the slide. Oh, uh, so they had some snake catcher who was out there trying to catch it. So oh, yeah, man. it's uh was it was it a, like when the when the uh plumber comes to your house and you got to stand there and kind of instruct them how to how to <laughs> do their job the correctly? <laughs> I was I was uh You going to use a, a Phillips head on a chin that? Wag, what they call having a chin wag with the fella that's <laughs> talking to somebody. Uh. I had a chin wag with the guy I asked him about what his business is like. Yeah, it's cool. But yeah, back to the topic I suppose. Uh I run and is this good for you and Conley, I know that you're interested in this topic because you have picked up this book, Born to Run, right? Born to Run. Yeah, I have looked through it. Uh, do as uh, I read, not as I actually do <laughs> in sitting <laughs> on funny. my I don't, I don't think there are any pictures this. in it. <laughs> I've been no. sitting down and reading a book about running, which makes no sense at all. But no, it, no. Uh, it's supposed uh, to inspire you. 
<laughs> I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually in the in uh, working out. I'm doing more weights though, but uh, it has inspired me to learn or want to learn a little bit about how running is ingrained in our DNA from an early age. And uh, interestingly enough, I read this new study that's coming out. Uh, early man, this kind of has something to do with it. Um, uh-huh. The re- uh, one of the reasons, and this is only a hypothesis, but one of the reasons women get colder than uh, men normally is because uh, in our ancestral state, men would want to go and uh, get away from the woman and go in a cave or go like somewhere where it's cool, where women would want to go out and bathe in the sun. And it was a, a way to prevent conflict between man and woman, because when man was with woman and woman was with child, man would take all the food and be aggressive and snore too loud and, and hide the remote and stuff. But then, you know, the, the woman would basically kick him out and he'd go into a cave. Yeah. Like the equivalent of going and mowing the grass. Exactly. Well, sure. Or quote unquote, cleaning the garage. Cleaning the garage. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sleeping on the couch. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that comes afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but interestingly huh. enough, in that same article, it mentioned how uh, uh, man, you know, and, and, you know, just humans in general uh, can outrun pretty much any animal on earth just because of endurance. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, that's kind of one of the central theses, I suppose, of that book, Born to Run, which everybody should read. Um, is this a lot of times scientists develop this kind of we, we focus so much on one thing we forget about more obvious things and so for the longest time uh, anthropologists uh, human physiologists have have studied humans as upright apes in terms of walking mm-hmm. and what no everybody kind of forgot is that we're, we're you know because on first at first glance we seem like we suck as runners Right. Even our best sprinters could easily get taken down by kind of an average, uh, you know, four legged cat or dog mm-hmm. uh, predator, you mm-hmm. know, a leopard. Uh, it doesn't have to be a cheetah to catch us, you know, and just about anything, any any decent sized predator can run us down and eat us and has been doing that for a long time. Mm-hmm. But we forgot that there is something we are really good at, and that is endurance running. Uh, just the short trot. We can do that for hours hours like and you don't even have to be an elite distance runner to be able to pull this off you know we have uh you know hundreds of thousands of you know middle-aged teachers and bankers run marathons Mm. every every year they train for it they can do it so imagine if if you did a lot of that from when you were a little kid that's what humans were probably like in the past and we were uh, there is this type of um hunting um, uh, pursuit hunting where, and this has been documented, it's, it's really well laid out in the book, Born to Run, that if you, if you just kind of jog after a, something like a, uh, an antelope, even a pronghorn, our really fast native West Texas, uh, you know, ungulate, uh, you can, you can chase them over miles and miles and miles until they get exhausted, collapse, and then you can just then start chowing down. <laughs> There you go. And this may be what, how humans uh, hunted in the past, just by kind of jogging in relays after these these beasts until they overheat and die. Um, and that's you know, it, it you have to be able to track the individual animal that you're hunting, or else you know you could lose it in a pack and a herd, and then it doesn't work. But humans were really good at tracking too, early humans, and so it, it actually works. And uh, even well, it. This is kind of a lost art that probably doesn't happen anymore. But in the book Born to Run, he does document a, an anthropologist who kind of becomes embedded with the San tribe in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what they're often referred to as the Bushmen of South Africa. And they, they did this within historic times, and he documented them doing this. Jogging after a gemsbok, a type of oryx, a type of antelope, until <laughs> over miles until they ran it down and killed it. And they don't, wow. you don't need a spear if you can do that. You can just basically start butchering it right there. It's, it's died for you. It's crazy. And yeah, yeah uh, well. there's, there's good evidence that, that that type of hunting was something. And we're totally, we're all capable of it if you just do a little training. 
this endurance that humans have is, I've always, um, what I say is that our brain is often what we give ourselves credit for from an evolutionary perspective. We do have a huge brain. But your brain can get yourself into trouble that your feet can get you out of, right? <laughs> your brain will take you on a trip uh, to go see the desert, right? A yeah. place where no human belongs. And mm -hmm. then your car breaks down. And your brain got you into that trouble. What were, what were you thinking? But your feet will get you out of that situation, your endurance. Right. Even a huge, out-of-shape American, terrible shape. I've, I've seen, I've taken kids on, on field trips where I've taken them on 12-mile hikes, uh, completely out of shape, no training, and they make it. Mm -hmm. This is something that a lot of animals can't do. I, I wonder how much the brain plays a role in that, too, though, because... Like mental toughness? Yeah, mental N not necessarily mental toughness, but fortitude. Like mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you're in a, in a severe survival situation, um, a human has the ability to kind of comprehend what's going on and understand how to get out of that situation. Whereas, a, uh, except uh, when it gets really desperate and then your brain starts making stupid. Choices. Yeah. Yeah. You go back to kind of primitive yeah. states. Yeah. There's like when you're dehydrated, your brain makes terrible choices. People start tearing their clothes off. All these sorts of things, whereas, you know, your your endurance uh, will will help you potentially get through some of the worst trouble. You know, and it does. It does. I, I, I think it's good to know this and to t tell yourself this if you're in a situation like that, that you have don't give up because you have incredible d endurance. It's one of the hallmarks of humans, one of the most unheralded survival values or survival uh, kind of things that humans have. Mm -hmm. Is the ability to walk, or if you're in a little bit better shape, to trot, to jog for 20 miles. I mean, there's very few. Conley, you might have read in that paper that humans can outrun horses yeah. over a given distance. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, sure obviously can. not in, not on the racetrack. But if you take that same horse and you run it over 20 miles, human, there are races like that, and humans routinely win those races, which is yeah. just crazy to think. And that was an amazing part of that book whenever, you know, you it kind of opens the inner power of who we are, really. Mm -hmm. And um, before we get too far, let's let's bring it back a little bit, Sean. Uh -huh. sure. So we're all we're all tetrapods and we all started as what quadra quadrupeds quad. Yeah, that's a yeah. tetrapod and quadruped kind of mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Four, four so limbs. we all started four, on four, the ground. Yeah, four-limbed. Yeah. And we got out of the right. ocean because we were like, we don't like those, you know. That's exactly, yeah. We don't like those Too those, crowded those, those lower fishes. Oh, yeah. Those lower fishes. We're better than that. We're, yeah. com we're coming out. And the whales, meanwhile, <laughs> the, 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 the I mean, uh, what, what was it? The giant hippos and the elephants were like. We got to go back in. Yeah. We don't. We don't like it out yes. here. We're, yeah. After and then about they turn two hundred million years. <laughs> yeah, and they turn into the whales, right? Yeah, and they're okay. like, oh, there's right. not enough stuff on land for it's us. Two way street. To We're done. Two -way street. Fickle, fickle tetrapods. <laughs> and then we have Michael Phelps. Yeah. Who, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he he has gills hiding behind his <laughs> his ears somewhere. Yeah, he's a merman. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so let's start from there. When we what what possibly yeah, so could have made you're, us you're want thinking, to get up on how do you, two feet. Yeah, how do you go from a four-legged creature to a two-legged creature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and why, why is it so you, unique? Why would you do that? Yeah. And why is it so unique in the animal kingdom? Well, it's 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 happened a few times. Mm -hmm. um, kind of the earliest example happened in, in Sean's favorite group, the reptiles, yeah. uh, way back in the Triassic. Um, and it's... You know, depending on on who you who you you follow, um, it's really mechanically a more efficient way of of getting around on land. Um, that isn't to say that it's that you can move faster necessarily, but bipedalism, especially upright bipedalism, is a much more efficient way of using energy. Hmm. So that that's probably what what drives that sort of transition. Is that instinctual or is it through our own intelligence? Well, no, it's it's just like like what we've talked about with with adaptation and evolution. It, hmm. It's you know it probably started out as some sort of mutation and and eventually became beneficial to whatever group. Hmm. Um, yeah, you could kind of see a slow transition 
shorter and shorter arms. Maybe, you know, and the sort of a transitional form would be something that spends a lot of its time as a quadruped and then gets upright and runs on two feet when it needs to mm-hmm. sprint. Tell and me. There's a great example of that here in West Texas. The collared lizard oh. is, uh, uh, spends most of its time crawling around like an ordinary lizard, but if you chase it, it'll get up on its hind legs and run and tuck its front arms in and and it looks like a tyrannosaur when it runs like that. I mean, yeah, that's what I was actually going to get at. Tell me we're going to evolve into Tyrannosaurus Rex and my childhood <laughs> dream is going to come true. Well, that's, well, no, that's we, kind of we, cool. Yeah. yeah. We I think we as humans rely on our hands way too much. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, you know, that's kind of how it all started tool tool <laughs> usage and you know, booger picking and all that. Oh yeah, the necess- you know, necessary stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. All right. But it do- that does kind of uh, draw attention to the fact that we are we're very strange for a biped mm-hmm. because we we are walking on our ankles whereas most <laughs> bipeds um, walk on their toes. Mhm. So if you look at a tyrannosaur and its ankle joint, right? You you should describe this, uh, Thomas. You're the you're the expert mm-hmm. on this. There's huge differences there. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's another thing that we see kind of a lot of variation amongst different groups. Um, dinosaurs have what's called a, a mesotarsal ankle. It's a uh, basically the the joint between the the two lower ankle bones and the the bones of the foot forms like a door hinge. It's like a straight joint. Um, other reptiles like crocodilians, um, the mo- the movement on the ankle is between the two major bones of the, of the ankle, the astragalus and the calcaneum. Um, so that kind of modification of the, the, the kind of ancestral crocodilian or reptilian um, ankle configuration is what initially allowed the earliest dinosaurs and all the dinosaurs that followed to be one of the first groups to establish what's called digitigrade stance, basically what Sean described, standing up on your, on your toes to move around. Um, and it's something that we see reemerge in mammals. Um, the, the greatest example of that is our, our cats. Cats have the most engineered, naturally engineered, um, uh, feet and limbs of any animal i think Mm. um and if you look at the at the forelimbs and the hind limbs of a of a cat it's just the tiniest little surface area on the bottom of the toes that's touching the ground and that kind of gives them that springy sort of yeah kind of bouncy bouncy yeah so that's that's And and that's more efficient you anything when you if you don't spend as much time in contact with the ground you're just barely tapping it that's going to basically lead to energy savings and um, transition, give you good kind of um, push off and and landing ability. Everything's better like that. Yeah. And yet humans have it's just this flat. kind of stupid flat footed. Now it's interesting though. This is the that's the way we walk. And like I was saying earlier, the focus has always been on our walking. So people kind of ignored the fact that when we run, we actually do it differently. And here's the thing that. That's really cool. If you run with shoes on, yeah, with running shoes, it forces you to run like like an idiot. You it forces you to run plantigrade with your heel on the ground. If you take your shoes off and go run across a field, look at what happens. Yeah, your toes you will not. You'll balls get your up feet. on mm. your toes. You'll get up on your toes, and that's that's the way your feet are supposed to take you when you run. And therefore, if you run in running shoes all the time, uh, that's what leads to injuries because you're mm. running wrong. You're running totally wrong. You should be running up on your toes. And human, the human foot and the human body is, you know, two million years of evolution of running uh, to to on your toes. We are we are trending towards running like a tyrannosaur. Uh, it's it's in it. You know, you can see it in our feet. It's not great because your your ankles still kind of tiny uh, compared to, you know, look at the way a dog, you know, you're, if you ever notice a dog leg, it's all weird and it's got that extremely long ankle bone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ours doesn't do that. If you force yourself to, uh, to get up on your toes, you'll see that we actually do have it. It's just kind of low. 
It's not very good. It's nowhere near as good as a dog or a cat or a tyrannosaur. But it's heading that way. Uh, and certainly compared to any primate, it's entirely unusual. Wow. Uh, all other primates have completely different feet. And it's not because we're upright walking apes. It's because we are good at running. Um, uh, the, this distance running ape is what we should be considered. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Well, uh, we're going to hit our first commercial break. But uh, after the break, let's talk about are we in the right posture? If we're running wrong, our posture's got to be wrong. Our whole skeleton must look like a mess on the uh, – if, if you could see 100 years or, what, a, a million years really in the future, uh, if we even last that long, I guess. Uh, yeah, imagine it, how, how weird – but our feet will be kind of sexy in another million years if we – Ooh, <laughs> la, la. I mean, I guess if you're in the cats, yeah. but – Need size 25 high heels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, well, we'll catch up this conversation right after the break. We are back, everybody. Dr. Thomas Schiller in the house. Dr. Sean Graham calling on the line all the way from down under. We've been talking about uh, just running being a natural thing and uh, the reason why we're on the top of the food chain as uh, human beings. But uh, we're not done evolving, I, I guess. Right, Sean? Yeah, it, that's hard to say. I think... Um... Yeah, we, we're, we're definitely continually evolving. I think a lot of the, the evolution of our feet and our hands and our, and our other kind of anatomical features was done in a totally different context than, than what we're up to now. Hmm. You know, uh, so, you know, for the first two million years of human evolution, we were hunter gatherers. There are very few hunter gatherer, uh, hunter gatherer cultures left. Uh, and it's becoming harder and harder to study them and to understand kind of the cultural context w from which we came. But we know enough to know that probably, yeah, we were subtropical apes where, you know, we probably uh, had to run down prey over long distances. And, and so running was, was an important part of our behavioral repertoire uh, that has kind of gone ignored up until very recently and has been kind of made famous by this really great book, Born to Run. Um, but there's yeah. one of the, I think the author of Born to Run got, got a hold of a really nice nature paper that kind of brought all this into focus and listed a bunch of the features of the human skeleton and human kind of anatomy and physiology that's directly associated with our, our running posture, our running stance, and um, less to do with walking. And up, up until then, that paper only came out in 2004. Uh, and up until then, all the research was kind of loaded towards, oh, yeah, we were this walking upright ape. For, and that was the key to our success. Mm. But this brought into focus this idea that, ah, uh, 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 actually um, – you know, running is more efficient, and, and you can't walk an animal to death, but by God, you can run an animal to death, and people did do this. Uh, and there's evidence from, you know, uh, anthropology that, that that definitely used to happen. And this brought in this idea, you know, there's all these features of the foot that are very interesting that are totally different from any of the other apes, um, which is pretty cool. And, you know, we always think about our hands as this amazing well-designed thing that is capable of concert, you know, piano and all these amazing feats, uh, the delicate touch, the ability to, to form language with the hands, mm -hmm. all these things, you know, the hands get a lot of credit. And this paper kind of argued that actually, you know, our foot is an amazingly uh, delicate and well-made and very tough structure that you really shouldn't try to injure because that, that's a, that's a that's a game changer right there. If a you know ape man uh, two million years ago injured his foot or her foot, they're dead. They're supper. Right? That's, that's a natural selection gradient that's very steep. Uh, that, that selection would have operated on the human foot very very well because if you're, something goes wrong with your foot, you're not going to orthopedist. You're not putting on one of those big casts. Yeah. <laughs> Ever, probably your tribe is going to leave you behind or euthanize you if you're lucky. Yeah. You know, that's a and big, big thing. <laughs> yeah, so your well, foot is very well designed. And if I may say so without getting into too much trouble, a very beautiful thing. 
<laughs> well, I can, I can, I can tell you think so, but uh, you've never seen my feet. Yeah, uh, I'll send you some pictures a little bit feet. later. But I've, uh, got, I've got some, I got some feet in mind, and they're not, they're not Thomas Schilling. <laughs> okay, well, that brings me to my next question, which is pretty. Uh, now, are the is the creation of tools like shoes is that helping or hurting our evolution? Mm, great uh, like in, in and that, it is it thwarting it? For, yeah, for most of our evolution, there's no such thing as shoes, right? And you would have developed really good calluses on your feet that would have protected you from almost everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, really thick. Your your feet almost would have been like hooves. Your your toes would have splayed out and been like almost like hands down there. Yeah, uh, it, your feet start looking totally different if you look at people who walk around on bare foot a lot. The, the feet become very broad, almost like hobbit's feet, I'll say, right? A little hairy uh, so little thing. This, yeah, they become this kind of extraordinarily tough and kind of formidable uh, organ uh, if you use them enough the right way. And people probably started putting little slippers on their feet just to protect from briars and, uh, you know, sharp stones. Yeah, you know, there's there's uh, slippers like made from agave or, or fibers or yucca fibers that go back pretty far in the archaeological record, you know, like something like ridiculous, like six thousand years. So people have been protecting their feet for a long time, but putting this ridiculous air inflated plastic thing on your foot uh, and pumping it up Air Jordan style or whatever, that's that's only been in the last forty years. Yeah. And that and and one of the things that the author Christopher McDougall points out in that book is that it, it, contrary to what you would think, injuries to the foot and to the hips and the legs associated with athletic performance have only increased the more complex and ridiculous and protective our shoes have gotten. Mm. Well, That's also got- also your foot strength too. It's it's really yeah. important to keep your feet strong. And yes. when people walk around in shoes, they're not really exercising their, their feet. That's right. So, like, when I go to the gym, I do, I do like, calf raises, and I, I, you know, kind of rest myself on the edge of a, a plyometric box and do raises like that. Uh, because my feet are messed up. They were messed up since the beginning. They're flat as a pancake. Yeah. And Can like, you send a picture to Sean? <laughs> <laughs> If you do, can I make some suggestions on what pictures you send? <laughs> <laughs> Covered in calluses and maybe maybe my feet are, are actually the optimal condition. They're flat and, and wide and covered in, in gross yeah, calluses. It sounds, it sounds like they're uh, they've got a lot of potential. Yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint all the all the the fans out there who are envisioning my feet as being beautiful. <laughs> well. Well, manicured. <laughs> well, uh, a, an artist that we play here on KVLF, uh, Michael Franti, hasn't worn shoes in 14 years. Apparently, he's wow. never been to, uh, he's never toured in Alpine, Texas and stepped on a goat head sticker. Does he live in Marfa? Because that would change pretty quick. No, no. Yeah. I think well, he has been to Marfa, though. To, to try the, sh- uh, the original shoe was probably invented for something like goat heads. Something yeah. that yeah. could puncture, it would, could puncture all the way through a very well calloused foot. Right. Um, and that would be like, OK, if that puts you out of commission and you're a hunter gatherer. So we got to do something about this. Put a slipper up, yeah. a slipper of yucca leaves. And yeah. that's probably what the first shoe was invented for. Not not so that you could jump higher in a basketball game or so that you could supposedly protect your feet or make you run faster. Or even so, impress all the kids in the third grade, you know. Yeah. Which is With your yeah, that's, L.A. lights. Or your, or your L.A. lights. Yeah, I love those. Hey, That's exactly so, right, Sean. This this may be a uh, Australian stereotype, but is it common for people to walk around outside when they go walk about with no shoes on? That's something I remember seeing, like on on documentaries and things. People in the outback just walking mm-hmm. around, not even like not ab- even indigenous aboriginal? people, not not even not just even aboriginals, just people? just uh, you know. The kind of no, cut I, off, cut off uh, uh, denim cut off vest, yeah. yeah, guys. You know, I don't think. No, I wouldn't say that's uh, a very common thing. I think that there are, there could be some sort of subculture out there. I have heard uh, that um, if you're walking around in desert sand, a lot of people will abandon shoes for flip flops. 
mm-hmm. and or some other kind of uh, short slipper. And so that might be what you're seeing, um, uh, something like that. And that could be that could be real, um, or you know, go, just going com- totally barefoot. There are a ton of burrs out there in the outback. I've been out there um, in the red sands and stuff, and there there are a lot of goat head like things that would be worth putting on some flops to keep yourself protected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, that could that could be what you saw that, um, you know, basically in desert sands, n- there's just nothing, no shoe can prevent sand from getting in the shoes and just driving you nuts okay. and, and causing abrasions. And so a lot of people will just wear uh, slippers, okay. um, even some of the like the serious hardcore dudes in World War Two fighting in North Africa. Uh, those guys would take off their stupid boots and just wear uh, basically flip flops. Or little slippers like the that's, like the be- the Bedouin came up with. Yeah, hmm. that's kind of funny to imagine, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Soldiers out there, clop clop clop. What's that? What's that? Shooting up Rommel's me? supply lines and wearing yeah. flip flops. Yeah. Oh man. So yeah, that's crazy. So uh, yeah, well, we have evolved uh, into having these shoes, and now now we have the shoes. Dinosaurs didn't have shoes. <laughs> Not that we know of, Conley. We haven't dug any uh, fossilized uh, I'm, LA lines. I'm sure. I'm sure there's an episode of Ancient Aliens where they discuss the possibility of dinosaur shoes, <laughs> yeah. um, but they wouldn't have had the technology like LA lights. Oh man, we're, we're talking like okay. like Pumas, like Pumas New Balance or something. <laughs> new ba- new yeah. Balance, yeah. At least the dinosaur dads would have had the white New Balances. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, di- <laughs> uh, aside from from modifying the the ankle and the foot dinosaurs did something really cool um, which is actually one of the the kind of defining characteristics of the group and they're kind of the first group to achieve really effective upright posture um, that was you know most of the the well all, all just about all groups of dinosaurs had bipeds um, within them and this was achieved by modifying the the pelvis. So not the feet or the legs, but the, the pelvis. And I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw out a, a really great term that all of my students hate and try to memorize and never can. Um, and that is perforated acetabulum. <laughs> Sweet. It sound it sounds kind of dirty, but it also sounds yeah. kind of smart. So the acetabulum is basically where your the upper part of your femur, your leg bone articulates with your your pelvis um okay. in the connection it, it yeah it's it's a joint right yeah. and in our in our pelvis we have a cup a socket and mm-hmm. the ball of the femur fits into that yeah in dinosaurs they evolved a perforated or an open acetabulum where it's just an open hole mm. and you can see this in birds in modern dinosaurs where the the head of the femur just kind of fits into it like a peg and it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like a great design or, mm-hmm. or doesn't seem very mobile, but it, it's not. Um, yeah. And that's one of the kind of caveats of it. But um, it basically permitted upright stance. It, it moved the limbs underneath the body instead of kind of the previous configuration or the more ancestral configuration, which is the sprawling limbs. Right. Like what we see in modern crocodilians and a lot of lizards and things like that. And basically, that that seemingly simple transition allowed for dinosaurs, or at least from what we understand, to really become the dominant land-dwelling animals on Earth for 180 million years. And it all has to do with, with efficiency, with energy usage. You know, a lot of dinosaurs, especially the theropod dinosaurs, um, evolved into really fast-moving terrestrial animals, like faster than or as fast as cheetahs, right? Mm. But the energy usage became so much more efficient. And I, I always give this, this comparison to my students. Um, it might not be the best, but um, basically if you can imagine going from this sort of quadrupedal sprawling uh, posture with your arms and your legs out to the side to kind of similar to what we have where we have all of our weight distributed um, above our hind limbs, above our legs. Um, the best way to demonstrate that is if you're at home, kind of put yourself in a in a push-up position and try to move around for an extended period of time like that. Mm. 
all the the energy that's required to hold you in that that sprawling posture compared to how we're we're used to moving around. Yeah. Now the reason I say that doesn't necessarily mean uh, more uh, like greater speed or even uh, um, you know long distance capability. Um, it it's much more efficient in terms of energy. You don't require the muscles and tendons to kind of hold you out sprawled like that. Um, and you see, and there are a lot of reptiles that can move really, really fast over short distances with a sprawling posture. Mm. But presumably that kind of transition is what led to the dinosaurs becoming such dominant land dwelling animals. Um, and it's good that you brought up the, the, the range of motion when you have that sort of peg and, and hole um, configuration, oh yeah, there's not a lot of of adduction or abduction, basically horizontal movement. Yeah, it's all restricted to kind of the the the, the you know the midline, the plane of the body forward Seems and like back. Turning would be tough. Well, turn turning wasn't necessarily tough, but walking over uneven terrain would have oh, been, okay. would have been tough, mm. um, at least for the big dinosaurs. You mm-hmm. watch birds, and they're pretty capable of hopping around on stuff, but you never see birds like sidestepping like we can. Right? There's really no lateral range of motion, so it's all in kind of the 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 forward and backward plane of of motion. Um, so it would have been really funny to try and watch T Rex climb a mountain or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, really effective moving in one direction over even terrain, but not so much over rocky or uneven surfaces. Interesting. So that's why uh, some of the, you know, the the rock dinosaurs lived a little bit easier. Or is that even the a rock, real thing? The rock dinosaurs? The rock well- dwelling. Oh. Surely. Yeah. I think I know where he's going. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like uh, upland, <laughs> upland, upland dwelling dinosaurs. I got you. Yeah, so like you know, you, you'd had some sort of dinosaur, herbivorous dinosaur, hanging out on a rock outcrop. Yeah, yeah. So it could avoid a tyrannosaur. Right. Yeah. Right. And look down upon it and just crunch on its <laughs> tail. <laughs> yeah. Well, probably like later on in in the evolutionary stages of theropods, you probably had these little feathered dinosaurs that could pop around like like birds do. But yeah. Um. Yeah. A, a, a really simple sort of advancement, but basically put the dinosaurs on top of the food chain for millions and millions of years. And we know that thanks to fossil tracks, right? That's right. Yeah. We, and that's we, how we, we studied it. Yeah. We can, we can tell the difference between bipeds and quadrupeds and, and all sorts of different ways that dinosaurs would move around, how fast they moved. That they didn't always drag their tails. Uh, yeah. Most of them didn't. Yeah. Most of them held them up. So yeah. yeah the, the real ways, lazy ones. Yeah, the 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 I'm trying to come up with a clever dinosaur the, name. The World of Warcraft Dosaurus. <laughs> the the Lazy Saurus. There you go. That's that's about all I got for for Saturday morning. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but we can we can study trackways. Um which brings us to to a really cool discovery um that we'll talk about um here in a bit after the break. Hey everybody, good morning. Sean Graham here from the Science Nights and we're back. We're still talking about the evolution of bipedalism. Uh, getting up on two legs and and running. And we were kind of hinting at a, a really phenomenal new discovery uh, having to do with tracks. And we were just talking about how you can tell a lot from how dinosaurs walked around from fossil trackways. And one of the coolest things, uh, you know, you can obviously do the same thing for uh, understanding our own evolution. And so, for example... You know, one of the coolest fossils in my book is, uh, you know, right around the time that we discovered some of the earliest kind of ancestral humans, these ape-like humans that we call Australopithecines, which are, you know, a good one or two million year old kind of half man, half ape fossils. And they, we, we took apart these fossils and we, from these fossils, we could interpret kind of indirectly they probably were upright but no one was ever quite sure until we actually found a fossil trackway of an australopithecine um in east africa and it showed you know what looks like a human footprint and no knuckle marks Mm. and so this showed that yeah that all of our all of our intuition about these fossils was probably right and that we did guess correctly that these were upright apes and the first upright apes well we've got kind of a similar 
finding that has just hit the presses and, and locally. It's a, it's a local story in my book for West Texas. Uh, if you go up to the great, uh, the White Sands National Monument, just a couple of years ago, they had this great little display showing some of the archaeology and, and paleontology they were doing on the old lake bed, Lake Lucero, which was a ice age lake, a huge ice age lake that's now, you know, um, mostly gone. Uh, it does still, there's still a tiny remnant of that lake out there. Hmm. But most of those gypsum sands uh, from White Sands National Monument come from the evaporation of this lake, uh, the gypsum that evaporated out and then was later deposited as dunes by wind. And so that's an old lake bed there. And they've been steadily kind of digging away at the bottom of that ancient lake very meticulously. And that display two years ago that I saw had all this cool information about the, the Ice Age mammals whose footprints they were finding out on the lake bed. Things like mastodons and camels and, uh, you know, woolly Whoa. mammoths. Mm -hmm. and, and that was, and giant ground sloths. And it was a kind of a treasure trove of, of uh, without really good, like, bone fossil evidence, like you get at the La Brea Tar Pits, but of fossil trackways. And now the same crew who's been digging up those tracks for years out at White Sands have now found the astonishing find of human footprints out on the lake bed. What? And they've dated them. Here's the, here's the kicker. Now, this wouldn't be terribly surprising to anyone because we know that Ice Age humans did exist in North America. We've got stone points, uh, spear points associated with mammoths and, and mm. extinct bison from New Mexico also. Yep. Uh, so that, that's Clovis. not that surprising. But the, the age that they radiocarbon dated those tracks to, because the tracks had little bitty grass seeds stuck in the bottom of the track. from <laughs> when a little teenager stepped out onto that little mud flat and pressed down that little grass seed and then it fossilized. And they picked up the grass seed and radiocarbon dated it directly and they got 20,000 years. Wow. 20,000 years. Which is right in the ballpark of the time that our previous guest, Cyprian Albert Ardelian. Cyprian Ardelian. So in the ballpark, the same age that he was uh, suggesting he found stone tools down in Zacatecas. Yeah. Um, it's in the ballpark. It's way earlier than any of the accepted dates associated with spear points. Now, this is cool. This is where we could tie it all together. That means that humans were in North America if the date is correct, and a lot of people are saying they nailed it, uh, 5,000 years before the arrival of really good stone tools. So what were these people hunting with without stone tools? Their feet. Yep. Their they were feet. <laughs> they were doing the old kickarooski. Yeah. They were, they were kicking, them, the old, kicking them down. Run, running them down oh. to exhaustion until they died. Yeah, the, the first human hunters in North America could have been using that trick. Or, you know, if you don't believe that that's if you think that's not plausible, that just means that they were using something like a wooden spear or an ivory spear. And ivory and wood doesn't stick around as long as stone spear points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it does suggest if it, that, you know, spear points are really good because they do stick around. So if you get one and you get it dated r real well, then it, and, and you know that a human made it, it's an artifact. Uh, you, you've got it. But, uh, you know, pushing back the time that people arrived in North America, uh, you know, there are other explanations. In it, and that would be the explanation for this. If these are dated correctly, then that suggests that uh, humans were here a long time before those really cool spear points that we have been considering the first evidence of man in yeah. the new world, the Clovis points, the Folsom points. Yeah, those yeah, probably the are, same the same group that Cyprian was Could describing be. this this Could small be. group of kind of lost yeah. wandering humans who got yeah. cut off by the ice sheets. Yeah, wow. and maybe were replaced eventually by the Clovis hunters, or maybe the Clovis just indicates that some genius, uh, you know, uh, just invented an amazing stone point and it changed the game. Uh, so all these are all all possible explanations that are amazing now. But yeah, right up the road from Big Bend, uh, up in Southern New Mexico, yeah. Alan Gordo. An incredible, Alan Gordo, yeah. incredible uh, find has, has and, and it, this one I think will it'll be a long time before this one is, you know, if anything we're going to find more supporting evidence. Yeah, you my know, those guys they'll, they'll be out there digging. 
and find a stone spear point in the bottom of one of yeah. those or a skeleton uh, footprints or a skeleton. Yeah, something yeah. Harder. Yeah, lake deposits are really great ways of preserving fossils. So that's my hopeful prediction as a paleontologist that they're going to find. That we're I mean, what are the chances they found a burial. seed? And then it's, carbon it's, dated the seed. It's I mean, that is just what's preserved. Yeah, it's yeah. you just got to keep looking. That is looking. just insane. In Good those, Lord. In the, there's, here's the thing that there's no question. Like if you go if you go online and, and Google this topic, you'll see the footprints, and there's no question that they're footprints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like they may have dated them wrong, but they're definitely they're footprints from the same time period as Ice Age mammals. Yeah, yeah. and so they're that, definitely that humans. Puts it, yeah, they're definitely human footprints. You can't go wrong there. They're, and a cool thing, just kind of a neat little detail. Yeah. They seem to be uh, teenagers and children. Wow. So they're going out there, like, jumping around in the water. Nice. Playing, having fun. Maybe out there collecting, um, you know, invertebrates to eat. Yeah, food and Maybe. stuff. So so you've yeah. seen the, the picture of those footprints, right? The pictures, yeah. If you Google yeah. New Mexico, white sands, footprints, uh, your first hit will be of like a, it's a official national park service like ruler yeah um and these footprints and they look they're very cool looking they're obviously human footprints and they're yeah. there's no like s- s- smoking gun picture of like a footprint of a human next to a footprint of a woolly mammoth right but they're definitely in the same vicinity and they're getting them in the same um kind of uh ex- what, what would you call that the same horizon yeah uh-huh. as they're getting um ice age mammals if you could so, rate if you could rate that foot from one to ten <laughs> what would you uh so, some of them you know there's some zero <laughs> uh, this has gone to a dark I'm place like <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. well that's very cool um I'm speaking get, of I'm speaking in... of of <laughs> ice age footprints um, next week is Earth Science Week, everyone. <laughs> How's that segue? Good segue. Yeah. Yeah, right on the money. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is not, not just because Earth Science is cool and we should all celebrate uh, the full week of, of Earth Science Week, but uh, up on campus at Sol Ross, we're doing some, some cool stuff, the geology program, um, and I've got the schedule here on my phone, so I apologize if I'm, I'm reading and speaking at the same time. Uh, so starting Monday, we've got some stuff uh, going on. You can come up to the, the science building and find one of us friendly professors um, and chat about rocks and geology and stuff. The special events start on Tuesday, October 12th from 10.30 a.m. to 1, 1 p.m. at the UC on the first floor. Um, we'll have a, a groundwater model and talking about hydrology um, and there will be geology faculty there if you want to bring your, your, your rock samples or fossils over to have them identified. Uh, doing similar stuff on Wednesday, but in the Warnock Science Building from 2 to 5. Um, I'll be there. Um, it's National Fossil Day. Me being a paleontologist, I'll be talking about fossils. And if you want to bring your, your own fossil samples, I can help you identify them. and We can chat about that. And then on Friday, it's Geologic Map Day. From two to five in the Warnock Science Building, uh, come by and we've gonna we're gonna have some geologic maps on display, and we can talk geology. And once again, you can bring by any any rocks or your entire rock collection, and we can have a good time talking about geology. Well, so. sounds that hey, it sounds like a, the week ahead of us is a pretty good one, huh? Yeah, it rocks. pretty educational. It rocks, yes, or it will uh, rock. All right. All right. Well, hey, thanks, y'all. We learned a lot today. We learned a lot about feet. We learned a lot about science. We learned a lot about ourselves. Sean. And we learned about a lot of a <laughs> we, lot about Sean. We learned a lot about Sean. Uh, check your spam uh, filter, Sean. Uh, I sent you a couple emails. All right. Well, we will see y'all next week, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. Uh, this is Science Nights in the Morning. Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.